Eyewitness News is your local election headquarters from our studios in East Providence, a debate between the two candidates for mayor of Taunton. Hello, everybody. I'm Tim White, and thank you for joining us on this special edition of Newsmakers. You will hear opening statements from both candidates in a moment, and they are from left to right on your screen, Estelle Borges. She has served for three terms on the Taunton City Council, and Shauna O'Connell, who was elected as Massachusetts State Representative in 2010. I will be moderating this debate along with my colleague, Ted Nisi. I want to thank you both for agreeing to participate in this debate. We will begin with one-minute opening statements, the order of which was drawn randomly prior to this debate. Up first is Ms. Borges. Ms. Borges, your one-minute opening statement. Thank you, Ted and Tim, for having me here today. My name is Estelle Borges, and I'm a Taunton City Councilor. I've been on the City Council for almost six years, and prior to that, I served on the Zoning Board of Appeals. I'm the co-chair of the Community Crisis Intervention Team in the City of Taunton, which deals with police officers and our social service agencies to help families that suffer from addiction and mental illness. I'm also the mother of two children in the Taunton Public School Systems, and I'm a small business owner. And I'm the only candidate that's qualified to be the next mayor of Taunton and ready on day one. So I would appreciate your vote on Tuesday, November 5th. Thank you. All right, Ms. Porges, thank you very much. Now, Ms. O'Connell, your one-minute opening statement. Uh, good morning. It's an honor to be running uh, for mayor of my hometown of Taunton. Uh, my husband of 22 years and I are raising our two teenage daughters there. Uh, my community has given me so much opportunity, and it's very important to me to give back. Um, I was honored to be elected state representative in 2010 and to be reelected four times since then. I've worked hard to make a positive difference for the people that I serve. I have a positive vision for the future of our city to bring us from gateway status to a leading city in the Commonwealth. It will take a determined leader and a full-time mayor to make this happen, and I will be committed to the people of Taunton. Thank you, Ms. O'Connell. Now, we do not have any strict format for this debate. Ted and I are looking for an open and honest discussion of the issues, but if either of us feel like you're taking too long or you're not answering the question, we will jump in. Let's begin. First question to you, Ms. O'Connell. A major deadline is looming in Taunton. The landfill is scheduled to be capped in just four months from now, one month yeah. after the uh, next mayor is sworn in. The landfill, as you know, is not only important because it's where the garbage goes, but it is also an annual revenue generator for the city. The Taunton Gazette reports the city uh, took in $1.3 million in fiscal 19. Garbage collection is a fundamental function of city operations. What is your plan? So this is a can that can no longer be kicked down the road. Uh, we got our, uh, the city of Taunton got its last extension for the landfill in 2016. So that is really when the work should have begun, begun on the landfill. Uh, I have been having discussions with the Taunton DPW, with the TMLP, with the state to come to solutions for this issue. Uh, we need to also be talking to our neighbors in the region, uh, which will take a very long time to find a regional um, long-term plan for this. So it, it's unfortunate that that didn't start uh, years ago. Uh, but we need to start that conversation now. And at the same time, we need to be thinking about the end use of the landfill so that when it is capped, we are ready to go with a project that is going to be a revenue generator and that we're not, again, years behind the eight ball, uh, trying to play catch up and putting the taxpayers at a disadvantage. Any idea where the trash is going to go in February, though? I mean, uh, you're talking long term, maybe solar panels, right. whatever. Right. But come February, you got to find a place yeah. for that trash. Right. So there will be an interim solution, a short term solution, where we will have our um, our municipal waste uh, to go to a transfer station, and that will be most likely trucked out or on rail uh, to uh, to another state. Before we go to Ms. Borges on the, on this issue, um, that short-term solution, um, can you guarantee to the people watching right now who live in Taunton that pay, I believe it's two dollars for the Orange yes, City bag, yes. that that price will not go up come February? Can you guarantee that? Yeah. Well. 
I think what we, we need to think about is not always reaching into the pockets of the taxpayers every time there's an issue. This, this, this has become a crisis issue. One city council recently talked about we are in dire straits. I will not let our city get in dire straits on any of these issues. So we really need to think creatively about how we're going to pay for this. Um, we do have some debt that will be coming off the books that we can redirect. We are going to be having revenue coming in from marijuana establishments uh, that we can use for that. So, so there, there are solutions that we can think about rather than going right to the taxpayers and reaching in their pockets. Not hearing a guarantee on that answer, though. Are you stopping short of guaranteeing mm -hmm. uh, no increase, at least even temporarily? Temporarily, I will not it be increasing the cost of trash bags. We need to find creative solutions, think out of the box, and not reach into the pockets of the taxpayers. Ms. Borges, what is your plan for the closing of the landfill? So I'll start by saying that our city is far from in dire straits, um, number one. And as someone that has served on the Solid Waste Committee, the can has far from been kicked um, down the road. I mean, we've actually been meeting, and um, we have an RFP that we sent out for the landfill that will be capped in 2020 in March. I've actually explored um, different options on the landfill where I looked at um, perhaps not taking trash from other cities to see if we could save the life of the landfill and extend it. Um, but we have been working hard on the landfill. Unfortunately, we didn't get the help from the state legislators to actually try to solve a problem that is not only citywide, but statewide and nationwide. So we have a contract. Um, we have sent it to the mayor. I've been part of those discussions, actually. And the way it's going to work is it's not a um, long-term solution or a short-term solution or any of that. It's just a plan. So what we have now is we have a local um, business, um, and it's actually G. Lopes, I can publicly state that because we voted on it, and we have um, the trash that is going to be taken to the transfer station at G. Lopes, and it's going to go on a train out of state, and that's our temporary plan. Right now what we're doing is we're negotiating those loyalties because, as you said, we got $1.3 million um, from the landfill, um, and we wouldn't be getting that. There's, if we had gone with um, stopping the trash from other cities and communities, we would have lost the contract with waste management. Therefore, the city would have been responsible for the long term of that landfill. Ms. Right Borges, now, I, I want to jump in just before we get too detailed into that plan. I think, again, the same question to you that I asked Ms. O'Connell. Uh, this short-term plan with uh, the uh, contractor that uh, put the bid in, uh, what will that mean for the $2 a bag um, uh, situation right now? I have no problem stating today um, to the viewers at home that under our administration that that two dollar bag will not go to the fictitious rumors that are out there to six dollars a bag. We have many ways of offsetting the cost of those bags. Um, we have a lot of money that will be coming in from some of our retail marijuana and our medical marijuana. We are going to be taking some debt off the, the roll soon which will help to offset that. And uh, the city, like I said, is not in dire straits. There is monies there to offset that cost of the trash bags. So to the viewers at home, I will guarantee under our, my administration that that will not happen. And at the same time mm -hmm. that we're looking at this um, short-term plan for our landfill, I'm also looking at trash to energy, because that's something that we need to look at at the same time. All right, thank you. All right. If, if I could just respond very quickly, because I was 30 seconds. 30 there. seconds. So uh, last year, I did. We don't want to do the whole did, show and uh, yes. the landfill. Uh, last year, I did uh, say that the state is willing to talk with the city, and they need to put a plan in front of the state. Um, so I did make that connection, and I've talked to the state since then. They do want to see a plan. I've uh, told them that I would like to bring in developers so we can sit with them, talk about what technology is acceptable, what we can use going forward, and make that plan. So that, that could have been started a year ago, but the city did not initiate that. All right, do you feel like you need to respond to that? I'll give I you 30 seconds. I would just respond by saying as a city councilor um, that works full-time and will be a full-time mayor that, you know, I don't wait for people to come to me. I you go to them, and I try to find solutions to that. As council president and as someone that's been on solid waste, I have not had those conversations and have asked for those conversations with um, the representatives for some solutions to help with our landfill. And, um, you know, I did have one state representative that's no longer with us, um, State Representative Oral, that we had 
many of discussions with that. But at the time, the city was was in the middle of a potential lawsuit with um, waste management. So. All right, um, let's let's move on. This election, as you both know, is an open seat because Mayor Hoy unexpectedly announced he'd be running just a day before the, he would not be running. Excuse me, just a day before the filing deadline because he received an appointment from Governor Baker. Uh, Ms. O'Connell, who like Governor Baker is a Republican, uh, quickly announced her campaign, and that raised questions about whether the GOP orchestrated this election. Um, Ms. Borges, I'll start with you. The head of the Massachusetts Democratic Party sent a statement to reporters calling that sequence of events, quote, undemocratic and the type of tactic preferred by dictators. Do you agree with that? I do agree with that. I mean, I was, um, you know, that's running for mayor of the city of Taunton was something that I had thought of. I thought our mayor was doing a really uh, great job. I saw no reason to actually run against him. And unfortunately, the voters weren't given choice on the day that the um, papers were due. There was an announcement that the um, mayor would actually um, be appointed as the Register of Probate to Taunton District Court, leaving, you know, the public, the, our constituents with no choice. Luckily, I have a very flexible job in health care, and I was able to leave where I was, go to City Hall, get the papers, the nomination papers, and bring them to where I have an office and um, put a Facebook post out and had 178 people sign my papers and I brought him back to City Hall and that's what got me on the ballot. If it wasn't for that, I would have not have been on the ballot. So I think it was a very unfair process. Um, if, you know, there was no heads up, I mean, actually the governor and the lieutenant governor both admitted to the fact that there was, you know, um, that Representative O'Connell was given the heads up on this. So I just thought that was unfair, you know. Um, you know, uh, let me ask you, Ms. Borges, it's not like Democrats in Massachusetts have never uh, given their party, fellow party members, a heads up, a leg up. They've changed special election rules right. and things. Why shouldn't the governor and lieutenant governor help their fellow Republican who they think be a good mayor? Because I just don't think that that's fair. I think that, um, at, you know, I was fortunate enough to get on the ballot, but I know of many people, there would have been 10 other people that would have been on that ballot given voters' choice. And in this case, voters didn't get choice. I mean, I was fortunate enough to get on there, but we would have had 10 other people, like I said. Well, Ms. O'Connell, I'll turn to you. Of course, people calling, saying a backroom deal, um, you know, the kind of thing voters don't always like to hear. How do you respond to that critique? Everyone was wondering what Tom Hoy was going to do because he hadn't turned in his papers. Uh, like Estelle just said, people were thinking about running for mayor, including herself. There was speculation on what was going to happen. Uh, there was a news story in the local paper about whether or not Tom would run. Uh, can, uh, candidates for city council had not turned in their papers to run. Um, Estelle was one of them uh, until the last minute. There was a Facebook post by Estelle saying that she would like to run for mayor. So, so it wasn't a secret about Tom not possibly not running for his office. And everyone had the same opportunity to pull papers that day, get their 25 signatures that are required, and get their name on the ballot. And as a matter of fact, four people did that. There has not been an election within recent history or memory in Taunton with more than three candidates in it. And this one had four candidates in it. So, um, you know, to, to the question I put to Ms. Borges, I'll flip it around. For you know, Republicans have complained many times over the years about Democrats kind of mm -hmm. putting their thumb on the scale in Massachusetts for their party. Again, I think of the dancing around with how we do special elections for Senate. Um, you know, is this isn't this the same kind of behavior now that your party has power to to give you a heads up on that? Well. A lot of people knew at the same time, and there are news articles out there that leading Democrats also knew at the same time. So everyone had the knowledge. All right, we're going to move on so to. So if I could just uh, respond to that quickly, um, thirty seconds. Completely um, untrue. I actually um, submitted my papers right away. That's not true. And the Facebook post that was posted out there wasn't from me. It was from one of my colleagues who made a joke about it because. The mayor had not sub turned in his papers when he had announced on that Thursday in the Taunton Daily Gazette that he was submitting his papers. He was just waiting for his chief of staff to get back from vacation. So that's completely false information. Thirty-second response. Characterized. Uh, I what I what I had said was two uh, city councilors did not turn in their papers for their city council race. They were waiting, and that usually happens right away. So it, it's clear that people were thinking about running for mayor, that everyone had the opportunity to pull their papers, and that there, are four, there were four people in this race, more than there have been in 
any race in recent memory. Can believe it or not, we're halfway through the debate already, so I'm going to move on to a rapid fire section right now. We don't want to belabor these issues. We'd like to get through them rather quickly, so I'm looking for a one or two word answer on all of these questions. I'm going to alternate the order. Ms. O'Connell, the first question goes to you. Do you support or oppose term limits for the office of mayor? I support term limits and for the office of mayor. How long I would the, the term limit be? I think there would be anywhere from somewhere in the area of five terms. Ms. Uh, Ms. Borges, support or I would support um, term limits for mayor, and that would be for five terms, but I also um, would also extend the time. I think that um, two years is just not enough. Okay. Uh, Ms. Borges, do you support or oppose Governor Charlie Baker's ban on vaping products? I do. And Ms. O'Connell? I do not. Okay. Uh, there are, you know, we're talking about adults who have the information and knowledge they need whether or not to buy those vaping products. We need to keep okay. them out of the hands All of right, children. Next question. Can you pledge right now, uh, Ms. O'Connell, that the property tax rate will not increase under your first term? Uh, the one thing that we need to do is think about growing our business community to take the... Can you pledge right now yeah. that the property tax rate will not increase under your first term? I will not increase the property tax rate. Okay. Uh, Ms. Borges? I will not increase the residential tax rate just like I have not in the last three terms. Ms. Borges, do you support or oppose the major education funding bill recently passed by the state senate? Support or oppose? I support. And Ms. O'Connor? I support that. I think it has some great funding in it for our schools that is desperately needed. A through F, Ms. O'Connell, what letter grade would you give for the job performance of Mayor Hoy? Mayor Hoy? Um, I would say a, a B. That's a good grade. Uh, Ms. Borges? I would give um, Mayor Hoy a A for his efforts. Okay. All right, let's talk about the casino. Uh, this is a long-running uh, potential business initiative in Taunton that's gotten attention all over the state and, and outside the state. The effort by the Mashpee Wampanoag to get a casino, it's tied up in seemingly endless legal battles in Congress. But if somehow those hurdles are cleared, and I'll start with you on this one, Ms. O'Connell, do you support the current plan, again, if things happen in Congress that would allow it for the casino in Taunton? So the Taunton voters did vote in favor of a casino. It was an overwhelming vote um, in most of the city of Taunton. So I have supported what the voters uh, voted for, and I would continue to do that if that happens. We are a long way from that road. I think we have a long process to go through right now with the federal government uh, and their decisions on what's going to happen with that. At the same time, we really need to look about having an alternate plan uh, if this casino does not happen, what are we going to do there? Um, will we buy back the property? Will it be sold to a private developer? How will that land be developed? And I would really want to make sure that the people um, in that neighborhood that live there have some input into that because they have really felt left out of this conversation um, where they were a lot of them were opposed to the casino. So I want to make sure that we're listening to them and giving them a voice in the conversation as well. Ms. Borges, same question. The casino plan, if, as Ms. O'Connell says, it looks far away, but let's say it right. got through Congress and could be done. Do you support the plan as currently set out for the casino? Right, and we um, both, um, Ms. O'Connell and I, um, supported the casino, and I supported the casino. And I, the casino has not cost the city any mm -hmm. money, and we have actually mm -hmm. gotten money, and thankfully the city is in such great shape financially that we haven't had to um, depend on that money. I think that with the casino, it is a long ways away from actually coming to fruition, but um, I would reinstate our redevelopment mm -hmm. authority because I think that the city of Taunton is missing that redevelopment authority that was uh, a group that was looking at what the best use for every property was. So we would have to look, if that wasn't going to happen, then we would have to look at the best use of that property. And with that redevelopment authority, there would be people, um, not only business owners, but also residents to be on that committee to help find what the best use for that property would be. We're going to move on to immigration. Cities and towns across the country uh, take dramatically different approaches on how their law enforcement agencies cooperate or don't cooperate with immigrations and customs enforcement or ICE. 
Some communities will not recognize administrative detainers from ICE, which are requests from the immigration agency asking police to hold a person in custody for 48 hours. Other communities will detain an undocumented immigrant so that ICE can retrieve them for a civil immigration proceeding. As mayor, what would your directive to your police department be, Ms. Borges? Uh, my directive act is to actually to the police department would be no different um, than it what has been. I mean, I don't support sanctuary cities. I'm actually um, an immigrant myself. I was born in Portugal, and we obey by the rules. And I think that our public safety and our police department is doing a great job. We have no issues with that right now. They work very well with the state and with the federal authorities. So I would not support a sanctuary city. I think that we're doing what we need to do right now. Well, my question wasn't about a sanctuary mm -hmm. city, which can be sort of a nebulous term when we're talking about immigration. The question is how, what your directive would be to the police department, and, and you say it, it's to the continue, current policy. Right, so to, what is that current policy? To continue to do what they um, do. Once they, if they were to find an illegal immigrant, um, they would not, um, they would not automatically go to the state and the federal authorities. They would um, deal with it within house. So they would not hold an undocumented immigrant for 48 hours by the request of ICE. Is that, am I hearing you correctly? They would. They would. Okay. At, by the request of ICE, they would. All right. Uh, Ms. O'Connell, same question to you. What would your directive to your police department be as mayor? When we have... Uh illegal immigrants in our communities, some who are committing crimes. It puts everyone in danger, including our law enforcement officers. My directive would be that our law enforcement officers cooperate and work with the federal government, with ICE, um, whether or not there's a detainer. Uh, we should not be letting anyone who is um, committed a crime and who is here illegally back onto the street. What about those that have um you know, uh, that haven't, com you say, committed a crime. Sometimes people are taken into custody and they're not necessarily charged, and that seems to be the gray area. Would you um, still, if there was an ICE detainer out for them uh, for 48 hours, would your police department hold them? We need to follow the law, so yes, they should. Some police law enforcement leaders point out that uh, that can have a chilling effect on a community, particularly in a city where it has a high immigrant uh, population and it makes it harder for them to solve crimes because there's a distrust mm -hmm. between that community and the police department. How would you respond to that? I think what hurts the Im 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 immigrant community is allowing illegal immigrants who are criminals to be in their community because they intimidate, they commit crimes, and then these uh, illegal immigrants or immigrants who aren't committing crimes are afraid to come forward. So it puts everyone in danger, particularly the illegal immigrant community or the uh, any immigrant community. Uh, we need to be uh, Public safety has to be first and foremost in our minds, and that means cooperating with the federal government, cooperating with ICE, and making sure that we're getting people off the streets that are committing crimes and not letting them out the back door of courthouses or police stations. And we I think, if I may, and I think that that's exactly what's happening now. I mean, that's exactly what our police department does now. So, um, you know, I think it's it's a little misingenuous or misleading to. Um, to think that that's not what's happening in our police department now. That's exactly yeah, what's I don't think happening. anyone said that was not happening. All right, we're going to let's talk about marijuana. Hot issue in, in all over uh, Massachusetts right now. And I'll, st I'll stick with you on this, Ms. O'Connell. We checked yesterday, and the state records currently show nine companies seeking 13 licenses to do marijuana business in Taunton, including eight that were listed as wanting to open pot shops. Um, as mayor, do you think eight pot shops would be too many for Taunton, or could you imagine supporting that number? I think eight pot shops is a lot. And listen, as as a mom, I was not for legalizing marijuana. I didn't agree with that ballot question, but we have to uphold the will of the voters, and we will do that. Uh, one thing that I will ensure is that there will not be marijuana shops in our neighborhoods and close to our neighborhoods. We recently had a very controversial hearing where many, many uh, residents attended and fought back and were able to stop uh, a pot shop from being open in a very controversial location. Um, unfortunately, Estelle voted to let that pot shop go forward um, against the will of many, many residents that were very uh, vehemently against that. So and if I can I'll respond let, yeah, to that, Gazette, yeah. And I should just, to, yeah, it is true that you voted. So, um, so I looked at the big picture and this is the part, the, 
the part of municipal government and the things that happen on a day-to-day -day that Representative O'Connell actually doesn't understand. So we had four uh, pot shops that are being proposed on that, that street there on Winthrop Street. And I looked at the entire picture. Uh, we voted for the host agreement. Every single mm -hmm. pot shop that we have, a proposed pot shop, it's on highway business. It's zoned highway business. There are mm -hmm. residents in that area. I looked at the big picture, though. With the four pot shops that are proposed in that area, maybe even five, that one actually had the best location, which I thought, of the four. And it actually was being, um, it's being run by a company that is local. It is r being run by a company that is established. And none of the other four, there's going to be one within a thousand feet of the other. So for me, it was picking the best one out of all of those. And that's the reason why I voted for that. And this neighborhood was a mile and a half away from where this pot shop was going to be. They tried to say it was traffic. We put a light there. I mean, we did everything that we possibly could for the neighborhood. But for me, it was looking at the big picture. Who the developer was, what the experience was. It was zoned highway business. So that's the reason why I voted for that. There's others that, that I voted down. I voted down one that was on Route 140, which was right in front of a senior housing, four different housing complexes that had many children, a school. Um, so I look at the best interest of the neighborhood, but I also am looking at who is involved with it and what kind of experience I want to let Ms. O'Connor respond. You know, in the end, if you, if you approve a pot shop, it has to go somewhere. What's your response right, to right. that? So it sounds like that was a choosing of the lesser of the evils, uh, where to put that pot shop. Taunton is a very large community. It's a, a large city. We can ensure that these pot shops are not near neighborhoods. And I think, you know, the big picture is really taking care of our residents and our families and our children and their wants and needs and protecting children from these things and understanding that you know it's not the fabric of that neighborhood whether it's a half mile away or a mile away those people are going to drive by it every day their children are going to drive by it every day they're going to go for walks in their neighborhood and they don't want those things near their neighborhoods i think we can find alternative it, 15 it, seconds it's, to close okay. it up. So if I may, that's a current liquor store, and any child can walk into this liquor store now and buy potato chips, candy bars. Um, I don't know how this is going to you know, be any different. It's actually going to be more secure, where there's security there. You can't get in there if you're not 21 years old. So it, it would protect our children even more. All right, 20 seconds each for this final question of the debate, and we'll make it a fun one. Uh, many people watching this have never been to Taunton. If someone was thinking of going out on a first date, where should they go? Oh, on a first date. Wow, that's a uh, great question. So I think uh, if I was going out on a first date and I was telling somebody, uh, we have some great restaurants uh, in Taunton, and I think one of them would be La Familia. It's a wonderful Italian restaurant uh, that is uh, locally owned. And um, it's been a hot spot in our city. Always crowded. If this you do go, you'll have I, to make reservations. I would actually, <laughs> um, my favorite place would be the Pearl Restaurant, a Portuguese restaurant that is part of my heritage, and the District Center for the Arts, a performing arts center that I was a very big part of bringing into the city of Taunton, that we have um, a art gallery, we have musical performances on the second floor. And we did the whole debate to get two good restaurant <laughs> recommendations. Thank All right, you that's both. the end of the show. If you missed any of it, it's on WPRI.com. Vote on November 5th for Ted Nisi. I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week.